Okay, so going to start in a few seconds. Okay, assalamualaikum and very good morning. So uh, I think I will welcome everyone today uh, morning. And uh, this is our, again another uh, series from the Neuro Emergency Special Interest Group uh, class. Uh, today we have two lectures. And we will start with the first one as usual. Then following that, we stop in the middle. Then we start the second one. Okay, so now, without further delay, uh, before that, I just introduce myself. I'm Ashraf. I'm one of the um, uh, called, uh, members of the group. And I'm a neurologist uh, from Hospital Chanter Tuan Kumukris from Faculty of Medicine, UKM. So we changed a bit of our affiliation. We can talk about it later. <laughs> so, so today, uh, I will start with introducing uh, my fellow colleague, Dr. Gurjit. Dr. Gurjit is basically an uh, uh, emergency physician from Hospital Selayang. He just shared, interestingly, he has lots of uh, qualification here. So he graduated from Manipal, right, Gurjit? And university. And uh, he's basically, uh, I can see he's, multi-talented and multi-called uh, uh, qualified uh, emergency physician. Yeah, Gurjit uh, is basically also uh, awarded uh, with, uh, what call this? Anugrah Perkhidmatan Cemerlang in 2014. Uh, you uh, won a few awards, yeah? National Trauma Team Champion, Best Trauma Team Leader, uh, and also just the Modi Kenang here over here. So, and also uh, we, I can see this fellowship of uh, uh, trauma life support mission instructor and uh, uh, call nevertheless uh, obviously Gurjit is one of our neuro emergency medicine special group uh, called uh, uh, fellows uh, trainer yeah so basically today uh, Gurjit will be Dr Gurjit will be then sharing with us airway and pulmonary optimization in acute neurological emergency Gurjit the floor is yours okay thank you very much uh, Ashraf. And uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, you can hear me clearly, yeah? Just check with everybody one more time. Yes, can, yeah. Okay, I'll just share my screen so we can begin. Okay, can you uh, see my slides? Not yet from my end. Just, uh, can, can you get... Okay, okay. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Was okay, so, but uh, good slide. morning, everybody. Yeah. Can, can you see the slide? Yeah, now slide is there. Yeah, okay. 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 All right. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. Okay. Uh, we would like to start our presentation today. I would like to thank the College of Emergency Physicians um, and Neuro Emergency SIG for um, bringing up this interesting topic and allowing us to share a little bit on a little bit of our experience and also um, a little bit of uh, neurology life support on how we approach um, certain life support measures in neurologic emergencies. So today our topic is on airway and pulmonary optimization in acute neurological emergencies. So I have added a little bit a subtopic here, which is a practical approach, because uh, we know there are many uh, advanced methods that we can do to optimize airway and breathing, uh, oxygenation and uh, ventilation in um, acute neurology. But what is practical to our setting? What do we do commonly in our ED? And what can we modify in our day-to-day -day practice to ensure that um, we are targeting airway issues and targeting ventilation issues, uh, tackling hypoxia based on neurological benefit? So uh, without further ado, uh, I think Ashraf has already uh, introduced me just now. Uh, I am graduated from uh, Manipal MBBS and then uh, emergency medicine from USM and I've got an interest in neurology as well. I've got a stroke fellowship from the European Academies, uh, emergency neurology life support instructor and also a neuro EM SIG member. 
So my talks today uh, would be uh, based on these four references. The main reference is the Emergency Neurology Life Support Module that uh, we have adapted to our national setting as well in Malaysian Emergency Neurology Life Support. Um, a lot of the, the drugs and sedation drugs that we're going to talk about tailored to neurological emergencies are from the BJA, the British Journal of uh, Anesthesia. And, a majority, and the remaining part of the article's uh, reference is uh, from this article, A Practical Approach to Respiratory Emergency in Neurological Disease. I think it's a wonderful article and uh, you can have a look at it later. Okay, so um, an overview of the presentation today. So this presentation that we're going to do, the objective is to provide practical recommendations for number one, recognition of airway and breathing issues in neurologic patients. So majority of the patients who come to us, uh, we, we immediately tackle the neurology, but we have to recognize the airway and breathing issues first. The flow of management in approaching these neurological patients and the exact drugs and treatment that we are going to give them to protect the airway and breathing in acute neurology. So uh, there is a chart here. This is um, a, just a rough guide yeah, on acute respiratory failure in neurology. So we know that in neurology, um, if the, there is a lot of paralysis going on, um, there will be a lot of uh, hypercapnic respiratory failure, which the diaphragmatic paralysis and respiratory muscle paralysis is not going to allow expiration. Yeah? But we must also remember type 1 respiratory failure, which is hypoxemic respiratory failure, can also happen in acute neurology. Example, in acute stroke, a neurogenic pulmonary edema, etc., can cause a type 1 respiratory failure as well. Okay? So a very brief neuroanatomy, we are going to talk about a practical approach uh, to, to managing these patients. So we just touched briefly on uh, neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. There are many reasons for airway and breathing issues in acute neurology. But what is special in neuroanatomy? So if we can pinpoint a certain neuroanatomy that can cause acute respiratory failure, that can lead to airway or breathing compromise, then we have to talk about the Balba Respiratory Center. Okay, so this Balba Respiratory Center is located in our brainstem. Yeah, two areas in the brainstem, the medulla oblongata and also the pons. So in this respiratory center, which is located in the brainstem, in the medulla and the pons, are made up of three groups of neurons. Okay, that basically control our respiration. Two in the medulla, one in the pons. So in the medulla, if you can see here, the ventral respiratory group, the dorsal respiratory group, and in the pons is called the pneumotaxic center. The ventral respiratory group, I, I'm just going to brief this very crudely, yeah, so everybody can just get a good idea. There is a lot more functions here, but just a basic understanding. So the ventral respiratory group is responsible for expiration. The dorsal respiratory group is responsible for inspiration. And the pneumotaxic center is located at the pons just above that can inhibit, has inhibited properties of the dorsal respiratory center as well. So these respiratory centers then send respiratory motor pathways to our respiratory system that help regulate our breathing. So if uh, anybody's going to ask you about the exact pinpoint of neuroanatomy relation in breathing, then it would be the Balba respiratory center, three groups of neurons, uh, three yeah, groups of neurons located in two areas in the brainstem. So what happens when there is inadequate bulbar response yeah? uh, in our, let's say there is injury to the brainstem and there is inadequate uh, bulbar function. So what happens is the patient in majority of neurologic cases is unable to expire. Yeah? And this inhibition of expiratory muscle function causes a lot of retention, retained secretions and frequent complications followed up by pneumonia and then atelectasis and then followed by type 2 or a mixed type of respiratory failure. So this is a normal chronology, the pathophysiology that you see if there is disturbance in the neuroanatomy location of the Balba respiratory center. So recognition of respiratory failure in patients with acute neurological emergencies. Um, in our ED, when we want to, we, we see neurologic patients. Um, we always classify whether it's something chronic or is this something acute, yeah? So in a chronic respiratory failure, acute exacerbations mainly involve 
in slow progressive neurological diseases. They have already established neurological diseases coming to us with respiratory failure. Yeah, we have to recognize that. A second thing is in acute neurology. Example is in acute stroke, um, where patients come with, or in a seizure, in status epilepticus, etc., where the patient can come with a neurogenic pulmonary edema and also type 1 respiratory compromise. So we have, when we recognize respiratory failures in neurology, we have we always classify whether it's something chronic or whether it's something acute. And from there, we, uh, we, we, uh, we start to manage the patient. So we come to our uh, uh, main part of the lecture. So in a tailored assistance approach is what we always see. What we always do in the ED when we see acute um, patients with acute neurology or chronic neurology presenting with airway issues, we have a tailored approach. Number one, a manual and mechanical cough assistance. And if it's unsuccessful and patient is still having respiratory failure, you are going, going, going to non-invasive ventilation, NIVs. And if it's still not good enough, then maybe we have to intubate the patient and then invasive mechanical ventilation and finally a tracheostomy. So how are we going to approach um, this kind of patients if we are going to intubate them and ventilate them? So let's have a look. This is the gist and the summary of our presentation today. Okay, so uh, we are going to talk about um, special airway and breathing issues in neurology and uh, how our flow, we always see this flow in ALS, BLS, trauma, life support, etc. So what is special in neurology in terms of life support dealing with airway and breathing? So as you can see here, we will go into this one by one. So as you can see, um, when we recognize an airway or ventilation issue, we are going to plan for an intubation. And when we are going to intubate, normally we uh, do our seven piece and tube the patient. But over here, in this chart, you can see there is another factor, document focused neurological assessment. So before we are going to intubate, we are going to document a focused neurological assessment first, and then go into intubation because sedation, etc., is going to disturb our neurological assessment later. And then we are going to assess for difficult intubation. So we know our common terms such as lemon and moons, but what is special in neurology? Is there any other special scoring that can help us? We will discuss further on that as well. Uh, anticipation of difficult airway, intubation, special considerations. We will look at it again later. How do we reduce the ICP while intubating patients? Um, post intubation checklist. So what are the parameters that we want to see uh, dealing with airway and breathing issues post intubation? Special issues with sedation. So as we know that sedation can blunt neurologic assessment. So what are the methods that we can do such as anal go sedation? We will have a look at that later. And our ventilation targets. So we'll go at this one by one. Okay, this is the gist of the presentation. Today. Okay, so uh, uh, before I continue, uh, everybody can hear me clearly. Is that correct? Yes. Now, okay. yeah, the slide also appearing. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thing. So we start off with a case, a case that commonly presents to the emergency department. So a 65-year-old man was found on the roadside, alleged motor vehicle accident about an hour ago from the EMS response. The mechanism was the motorbike skidded and uh, history, the injury sustained was a laceration wound to the head. It was severe as the patient was only having response to pain and grunting and the treatment given by the EMS was oxygen and tranexamic acid. So I use this example because uh, we want to uh, relay the information on airway and breathing. Yeah? Uh, I think my senior gravies will be we talk better uh, detail by the expert later. But uh, let's give a general briefing on how we are going to tailor airway and breathing in neurological emergency. So indications for intubation. So should this patient be intubated? So a common reason in the emergency department would be yes, uh, for cerebral protection and for airway protection, etc. You know, and uh, suspicion of head injury. So in patients with acute neurology, uh, when do we intubate the patients or when um, do we have certain goals to intubate? Three main reasons in neurology to intubate a patient. Okay, first is to optimize the cerebral physiology. Okay. Second is to preserve the cerebral perfusion. Okay. And third is to prevent aspiration. So we're going to intubate a patient with acute neurology. Remember these three things. Do, if you have to prevent aspiration because of the drop in GCS, you have to preserve the cerebral perfusion. 
or you have to preserve the optimized cerebral physiology in oxygen delivery rate to the brain tissues, you are going to have to intubate the patient. So all these reasons are present in our patient. We want to perform cerebral protection and prevent aspiration as well. So now we have decided that this patient needs intubation. Okay. So before we go on to the to intubating this patient or assessing the airway, we have to document a focused neurological assessment. So this is something special in neuroemergency when we intubate patients with acute neurology, protect the airway in acute neurology. We decide to document a focused neurological assessment as recommended by emergency neurology life support. And the reason is because um, subsequent medication and sedation that has been given can cause sympatholysis that can mask the neurologic findings in the patient, that can delay neurological treatment for the patient, delay in getting the diagnosis. So what we normally do is a quick GCS assessment, a quick uh, pupil assessment, um, a quick motor uh, assessment as well, including the tone, power, and reflexes. Um, sensory and cerebellar signs might be a little bit difficult in patients with a blunted GCS, but um, definitely if the patient is responding, you, you can always uh, assess that as well, a very quick and brief one, okay? So at least we have a baseline neurology that can help us come to a diagnosis as we progress with our intubation. So intubation and ventilation targets focusing on neurological emergencies. What is special in neuroemergency, in intubation and ventilation? So um, as you can see, the special consideration in neuroemergencies uh, would be to anticipate and consider pre-treatment rise in ICP. So we always give our, um, our med pre-medication in terms of analgesia, sedation, and uh, paralytic. But in neurology, we have to think of preventing the rise in ICP during the process of intubation. So we will have a look at that later. Um, we want to avoid dysoxia because uh, we want to increase cerebral oxygen delivery rate and also dysventilation. All right. Um, in terms of ventilation and sedation, we have talked a little bit about it just now. Uh, we are going to um, give uh, analgesia-based sedation, which we will talk about later. And ventilation targets, SpO2 more than 94. Uh, some studies say 92, but uh, we are taking 94 according to emergency neurology life support. Um, a target a normal pH 7.35 to 7.45. Hyperventilation only in herniation syndromes. Okay. And uh, a normal tidal volume. So this is intubation and ventilation targets, yeah, focusing on neurological emergencies. So next, we, are already, we have already decided to intubate this patient. We have already got our targets in place. And now we want to predict a difficult airway. We have even done a focused neurological assessment. And now we are going to predict a difficult airway before we intubate. These are the common steps to intubate a patient in emergency, that's right. So we know about lemons, we know about moans, etc. Is there a scoring that is special uh, to neuroemergencies? Um, I would like to introduce you to a score called the Makoka score here. Uh, maybe you're not familiar with it, but uh, just to share with you, uh, we've, I feel that uh, maybe it is slightly more tailored to a neuroemergency setting when we intubate the patient. And the reason is because we have a few parameters here that we don't normally have here, such as obstructive sleep apnea. CO2 is very important in neuroemergency, ventilation and resuscitation and stabilization of an acutely ill neuroemergency patient. And uh, an obstructive sleep apnea patient would indicate that you need to be more aggressive with your CO2 management. And it is here in our score. So you have your Malampati score, obstructive sleep apnea, cervical spine movement is limited. So this is another thing in this criteria because when we talk about neuroemergencies, there's also a topic on neurotrauma. And if you have difficult uh, difficulty in movement of the spine, and then you can anticipate a difficult airway. Next, uh, mouth opening is also there in other scores. But another score here is coma. Okay, They have not defined exactly what a coma is. But um, if the patient has blunted GCS for me, then he would score one point on this score. Hypoxemia is also extremely relevant to neuroemergencies. We talk about optimizing cerebral uh, perfusion and cerebral physiology as one of our targets uh, to intubate a neuroemergency patient, right? So this criteria has hypoxemia as well. And finally, a non-anesthesia intubator, maybe I don't agree with it <laughs> since I'm an emergency physician. 
But overall, this score could be more predictive of a difficult airway in a neuro emergency compared to our regular scoring. So it is something special in neuro emergency cases we like to introduce to today, share with you. Okay, other scores are okay, no problem with it. But uh, just to introduce you something related to neuro emergencies. Right. So now um, we have already decided to intubate the patient. Uh, we have already done our neurological assessment. We have already seen the special considerations and also finally anticipated a difficult airway. Now we are going to intubate the patient. So these are certain measures and concerns that you can do uh, and, uh, and tackle yeah, while um, seeing these neurologic patients. Number one, cervical immobilization is necessary. So when let's say the patient is on a cervical collar, Either you remove the anterior part of the cervical collar, certain cervical collars have this feature now, or you remove completely and do a manual inline stabilization, okay? So that you can intubate the patient without uh, disturbing the cervical spine, causing further injuries such as spinal and neurogenic shock. Next is very interesting. This is something I think a bit uh, much more new for you guys. Elevated ICP is a concern. So where elevated ICP is a concern, example in bleeds, yeah? You want to tilt the head of bed to 30 degrees if you can intubate the patient that way. If not, the patient is at 30 degrees, drop him down to intubate and prop him up back at 30 degrees. Okay, because you want to drain the CSF, drain the venous return and reduce the ICP. There are two drugs that are considered in pre-intubation of a neurologic patient, which is lignocaine and fentanyl. Exactly why we will have a look at it later. It's very interesting. So you can consider pre-medication to reduce ICP, uh, lignocaine 1.5 mg per kg, uh, 60 seconds, and fentanyl uh, 1 to 2. Normally we give 1 to 2, it's written 2 to 3 here, mic per kg. And uh, consider manitol to drop the ICP and avoid hyperventilation, avoid hypoxia. Finally, compromise cerebral perfusion. So when we are going to intubate this patient, we always monitor the hemodynamics as well. So uh, you want to... We always target an MEP of 65, but we have to remember in an acute neuro emergencies to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure. The optimal target of an MEP would be about 80 to 110. So if you have a bit lowish BP, you want to maybe start an inotrope or you want to consider fluid bolus as written here prior to RSI to bring up the MEP a little bit to 80 to 110 to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure in the brain. Okay, We want to uh, maintain a target of more than 60. So we know cerebral perfusion pressure is MAP minus ICP and ICP of more than 20 uh, can be dangerous. So uh, uh, MAP of 80 is, is at a good place. Okay. Consider ketamine. We'll have a look at this later. We have always said that ketamine can raise ICP. That's no longer proven. Ketamine is actually a wonderful drug for neuro emergencies. And do not delay vasopressor use for blood pressure goals. So if you are going to intubate a patient, and your MAP is not reaching the target of 80, you can consider a fluid bolus or a inotrope infusion to bring up the BP prior to intubation. Do not delay that as well. Right. So now we are going to intubate the patient already. The pre-medication is being prepared, but you are going to order two extra pre-medication in airway and breathing optimization in neuro emergencies. What are these medications? What, what is special? You have lignocaine and fentanyl. So lignocaine injected IV has been shown in models to reduce cerebral, uh, sorry, to induce cerebral vasoconstriction, leading to a decrease in cerebral blood volume and thus ICP. So if you have a patient where you suspect a base ICP, there's unequal pupils there, you know, so you can consider lignocaine. And fentanyl, how is fentanyl helpful in reducing ICP? So fentanyl causes sympatholysis. It blocks the arterial hypertension and tachycardia and thus reduces the ICP. So both these drugs, you can read a few literatures. I've been doing a, a few literature review over the past few days preparing for this presentation. And there are many articles on uh, speaking on lignocaine and fentanyl as a pre-medication drug uh, to intubate a patient suspicious of a raised ICP. So this is uh, uh, something uh, new that we'd like to share with you uh, in airway breathing related to neuro emergencies as well, something special. So, okay, so we just go through the algorithm to see where we are now. So we have already uh, planned to intubate the patient. We have prepared, done our preparation. So head of bed is elevated to 30 degrees to intubate. If not, drop him, drop the patient down, bring it up back after intubation. 
We have already infused fluids to bring up the MAP to 30. We have already started our low dose vasopressor to ensure the MAP is 80 to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. And now, uh, pre intubation, we have considered two medications such as fentanyl and also lignocaine to reduce the ICP further. And uh, now we are going to proceed to intubate the patient. So, um, which medication do you use that is special for um, uh, inducing a patient to, before you intubate the patient? So, these are the common drugs that would be acceptable in neuroemergency. So, we spoke about lignocaine and fentanyl already. Esmolol is also very important. Okay, Esmolol, it reduces the ICP by reducing the blood pressure. Um, etomidate, it decreases the cerebral blood flow, thus reducing the ICP. Uh, but etomidate is not commonly used anymore. But if it is there, it can be an uh, alternative uh, drug. Propofol is very famous in neuroemergencies for anticonvulsant effects. And ketamine, that we have all uh, had a bit of uh, wary on always, ketamine is no longer proven to raise, to raise ICP. Yeah? So you can consider ketamine as well. All these medications that we have just mentioned blunt the rise in ICP. And that's the pathophysiology on why we use pharmacology and why we use these medications to reduce the ICP and uh, intubate our neuroemergency patients. Now, uh, a little bit relating on uh, our topic on uh, myasthenia gravis. So uh, we have already given our analgesia to the patient. We have already given the right sedation. We have already given our pre-intubation medication to reduce the ICP. Now we are going to give a paralytic. So uh, something special about paralytics is definitely in patients with myopathy, neuropathy, uh, denervations, etc. Yeah? So um, especially in patient myasthenia gravis as well. So the first question is, do you give it or do you not give it? And if you are going to give, which is the best medication? So we talk about the most common one first, our uh, succinylcholine. Yeah? So succinylcholine, uh, just a brief pathophysiology for you. It adheres to the postsynaptic uh, cholinergic receptors of the motor end plate and it induces disruption that results in uh, transient fasciculation, continuous disruption that leads to transient fasciculations, and involuntary muscle contraction, and then subsequently skeletal muscle paralysis. So uh, plasma pseudocholinesterase is responsible for hydrolyzation of the drug. So when would you not consider to give succinylcholine? Is of course, if the patient's pseudocholinesterase activity is reduced, or if, let's say, a myasthenia gravis, yeah? in which the, the, the uh, or other pathophysiology where the ACH receptors are destroyed. And in this, your succinylcholine cannot bind to the ACH receptors to cause persistent depolarization and then subsequently muscle paralysis. So you need to double the dose to hit the receptors, which is 2.5 times the dose. And um, uh, this, is, this is the theory, theory part behind succinylcholine. Okay. Next is rocuronium. So uh, our next drug, if we are not comfortable to give uh, succinylcholine at 2.5 times the value, um, you are going to consider rocuronium. So a basic pathophysiology is a non-depolarizing competitive blockage of the ACH receptor at the motor end plate. So would you consider rocuronium then? So which uh, begs the question, are paralytics necessary in the first place? So there are a lot of literatures out there that say that all patients with myasthenia gravis respond unpredictably to neuromuscular blocking drugs. So my reference is from the BJA, an article from the BJA. So um, whether you give scoline or rocuronium, the outcome is unpredictable. And another method, I think if we have done our anesthesia posting during masters, etc., you would have seen this, uh, the TIVA, yeah? total IV anesthesia. Propofol and fentanyl can provide satisfactory intubation and rapid recovery of consciousness. So a TIVA with short-acting agents like lignocaine or osmolol, esmolol to reduce the ICP can facilitate intubation without neuromuscular blocking drugs. So very interesting. If you can avoid neuromuscular uh, blocking drugs to intubate your patient, then you might consider TIVA with short-acting agents to drop your ICP. And according to this journal, it, um, it has favorable outcomes, okay? So it is not always possible to avoid neuromuscular blocking drugs, yeah? especially in patients who are very aggressive in neuroinjuries. Yeah? We have to give some neuromuscular blocking drugs. So 
which is better? So the recommendation from the BG, uh, BJA is rocuronium and sugamadex. Of course, sugamadex is the antidote. Why? So they even gave a reason why, right? Uh, myasthenia gravis reduces the ACH receptor densities and NMJ, and they are resistant to depolarizing NM, uh, neuromuscular blocking drugs. That's why you're going to double the dose, yeah? It is profoundly sensitive to non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drugs, such as rocuronium, profoundly sensitive to it. So some recommendations even recommend starting at one-tenth the standard dose. We do half the dose in emergency. But uh, some recommendations say that uh, one-tenth of the standard dose. And uh, sugar medex rapidly and reliably reverses the neuromuscular blocking drugs in patients with myasthenia gravis because it is not affected by anticholinesterases. In the, instead, it uses an encapsulation technique. So it, this really helps in your neuro assessment of the patient. Okay? So after you have intubated the patient using a paralytic, you can immediately reverse it and uh, help in neuro recovery or neurologic assessment of your patients. So that's a bit interesting on uh, paralytics there. A lot of controversies in the journals, but uh, this is, I think, I think the best approach that uh, we can tailor to our patients in the ED. So um, just a few points on um, specific neurological emergencies and airway and breathing considerations on it. Uh, it's a lot to speak on, so I just uh, put a summary. So our intracranial pathology patients who come to us, we are targeting ICP below 22 and MAP of 80. If you have a patient with brain ischemia, you want to avoid hypotension to save the penumbra especially. So you want to avoid hyperventilation. Consider ketamine. So where ketamine has always been a foe, uh, now it's becoming a friend. Yeah? So the NMDA blocker, ketamine, prevents nitric oxide release by acute ischemia of the cerebral cortex during a, a stroke and could be a therapeutic drug for ischemic stroke as well. So don't rule ketamine out. Uh, expanding hematoma, if you have a patient with ICB with expanding hematoma, think of ketamine as well. Um, lignocaine and fentanyl to drop the ICP, as we have seen just now. If the patient has neuromuscular weakness, choice of paralytics, again, we would start with TIVA if you can avoid paralytics. If you can't avoid paralytics, and then you want to consider rocuronium and then... Uh, Finally, if you have no choice, and then definitely scolding at a higher dose. Cervical spine injury. Uh, patients with cervical spine injury, you want to consider fiber optic or uh, difficult methods of intubation. It's a specific neurological emergency and airway and breathing considerations on it. So targets in post-intubation neurologic patients, we always want to maintain our SpO2 of more than 94. This is uh, based on our oxygen dissociation curve. So the, um, the rapid drop in oxygenation will not disrupt the cerebral metabolic oxygen requirement of the brain. A PCO2 of 35 to 45 to prevent vasodilatation or vasoconstriction of the vessels and a normal pH. So, which brings us to um, one of the last part of this uh, presentation, which is sedation. So, we have gone through the entire flow of airway and breathing consideration in neuroemergency setting in which we discussed um, consideration to intubate patients in neuroemergencies, a brief neurological exam before we intubate, and then the whole procedure of intubation as well, considering the cervical spine, the cerebral metabolic oxygen demand, the elevated ICPs, pre-treatment, pre-medication, consideration of paralytics, and now finally we have intubated the patient and we are going to start sedation for the patient. So normally we would start the patient on midamorph or midafen and uh, sedate the patient deeply. But, so the pros definitely in sedation is it reduces the sympathetic activity, reduces the cerebral metabolic oxygen demand, uh, reduces the cerebral oxygen requirement of the brain, reduces the cerebral blood flow, and reduces the ICP as well. But it uh, does not come with these complications. Yeah? So the cons is it makes neurological assessment almost impossible. I think we have all seen this in our experience in emergency medicine. And you can assess the neurology if you have sedated the patient deeply, almost impossible. So how then do you sedate the patients in neuroemergencies? What will you consider in your acute neuroemergency patients presenting to you? So I introduced this term to you today. It's called the anal go sedation, and it's got two definitions. Either it's an analgesia-based sedation or analgesia-first sedation, okay? So an analgesia-based sedation tells you, um, you would give usually an opioid, a painkiller, is used instead of a sedative to reach your sedative goals, 
okay? Uh, means you only give opioids, heavy opioids, such as morphine or pentanin. Anal GCR first sedation is an anal GCR, usually opioid, again, is used before a sedative to reach your sedative goals. So you can consider these two types of, uh, these two definitions and two types of uh, anal goal sedation in your patients. And um, the use of anal GCR in majority of doses Okay, we normally mix it together or you separate it in your center, MIDA and morphine, yeah, for example. So you will use this anal GCI, your opioid, in majority and use the sedative only as a supplement to top up the patient to ensure compliance to the mechanical ventilator. In this way, we achieve all our pros here and ensure that we can still assess some level of neurology at a certain degree in our patients. An example that is given here is fentanyl and propofol. So fentanyl will be a major and propofol will be used as a supplement. So this is anal GCR based sedation. Okay. And this is my last slide, the pass over. Now we have already intubated the patient, sedated the patient. Now we are going to pass over. So we're going to do a neuro exam pre-intubation. Going to pass over that. What was the condition before intubation? The ICH score, if this patient had a bleed. The gas exchange pre and post intubation to ensure that our cerebral oxygen delivery rate is at a good rate. The drugs that were used in intubation to see for cerebral protection uh, uh, measures that was done. Ventilation and ETCO2 targets, as we have discussed, SpO2, uh, CO2, pH levels to optimize cerebral perfusion. And finally, what anal GCR based sedation techniques that you, we had used to intubate this patient. So, uh, with that, I, uh, I thank you very much and um, pass it back to Ashraf. Thank you. Hi. Can you listen to me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, excellent uh, call, uh, lecture and uh, I learned a lot also just now. So can we see whether we have any questions? Okay, so we have question from Nina. Yeah, I think we start with uh, Nina question first. Uh, meanwhile, uh, everyone can also uh, type your question uh, in the chat if you're shy. If not, later you can also unmute yourself. So the first question, uh, Gujit, is about what is your opinion regarding the usage of NIV in patients with neuromuscular disorder related to neurological emergency causing respiratory insufficiency, such as uh, in the MGM, so GBS. You muted, uh, Gujit. Okay, so yeah. um, I uh, uh, personally have a, a very low uh, threshold uh, to intubate patients in uh, with a neuromuscular disease uh, presenting with uh, uh, respiratory insufficiency because uh, I believe that uh, um, this condition may take time to uh, to reverse. Okay, before we give our treatment, definitely. And um, we anticipate, uh, if we anticipate a clinical deterioration, the patient's already having a mixed type of respiratory failure. My, my threshold definitely is, uh, is slightly lower to intubate patients. Now. But uh, definitely, I'll leave it up to the uh, neuro experts to give their opinion to intubate. I think. Uh, uh, we can we can ask our uh, guest speaker or Dr. Ashraf himself for <laughs> <or> clarification. <laughs> Today I'm the moderator, Gujit. I'm not the guest speaker. You are the one. Okay. So uh, I called uh, because of Gujit mentioned a bit of the neuro side. So sometimes uh, we need to acknowledge that uh, uh, the, the number of uh, majority of the time the number of neurologists is not uh, called as many as uh, called internal medicine physician. Uh, or even an emergency physician, I suppose. How many emergency physicians in Malaysia now? Would you? Sorry? How many emergency physicians? Emergency physician in Malaysia? Oh, uh, almost 600. Almost 600. Correct, yeah. So only one more, uh, less than 150 uh, neurologists who are in Malaysia. So um, I, I think the, I totally agree with you in the diagnosis where you have a neurological disease that compromising the airway, uh, uh, you just treat as usual. So 
uh, if you think there is a uh, call uh, possibility of withholding intub intubation via NIV, then yeah, we can try NIV. Uh, but uh, if you think there's needs of intubation, especially in MG, uh, I think Dr. Hugh will share later, uh, then that's it, that, that will be a bit easy, uh, just as usual, as a resuscitation uh, call process. I trust that uh, emergency physician is uh, much more well-trained. Uh, yeah, And continuous uh, call in training compared to us. L last time I intubated the patient, also myself, and already many years ago. Okay, so uh, yeah, there's no other question. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Nina, uh, but, uh, Nathrina, do you think you want to uh, ask a bit more on this, uh, if you already answer your question, or I can also ask a bit of question. <laughs> oh, it's okay, it's okay. You can proceed. Okay. I think, I think, yeah, because, um, I agree because, uh, yeah, in in a tertiary center, uh, where you have a backup of ICU, uh, it would be uh maybe you may consider, but we also have uh medical officers, uh who are working in district hospital. You need to transfer the patient, so I don't think so. In that kind of situation, to put patient on NIV is uh, a a good thing. Another thing, you when you put patient on NIV, like Gurjit said, kan, you can monitor. There are certain scores actually, like Harco score that you can use. You know, right, Gurjit? So I think if if that kind of things uh, are not able to be carried out, uh, you do not have that kind of uh, uh, advanced knowledge or uh, monitoring to do that, it will be safer to intubate. But of course, both uh, parties carry um, similar risks, I would say. Uh, but uh, to secure the airway before the patient deteriorate further will be a, a, a better choice, la, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I really agree. So, uh, yeah, so basically, there's still no question over here. Uh, Gucci can, um, yeah, when you share just now, just go to my train of thought. I uh, write down a few notes over here. Uh, the, uh, there's a few uh, neurological uh, emergency. Uh, we have lots of neurology disease so, uh, from whether it can be centrally from the brain cortex itself. You mentioned a bit just now. Uh, and I really love looking at the uh, the pathophysiology just now at the brainstem. Uh, it can be also the peripheral nerve. Uh, uh, a bit we mentioned just now, maybe the uh, called gulen barre syndrome and uh, neuromuscular uh, uh, blockage. Yeah? So basically, then we will discuss later about uh, the uh, uh, mycena gravis. So, but uh, the, the one that you mentioned initially, uh, yeah, if you don't mind, you can share the, the slide just now, uh, the, the pathophysiology of the respiratory or bulbar weakness from the uh, brainstem just now. So um, when uh, called the treating patient, I, I don't know whether we're seeing more because we pick up with the current protocol that we have. Um, we do pick up medium medullary uh, stroke, for example. Uh, we call as uh, the syndrome, if you really like syndrome, Eponym, so then called Dagerin uh, syndrome. So it affects the hypoglossal nerve, and then the tongue becomes very clumsy in acute manner. Um, we know in our situation with excess of investigation acutely or hyperacutely, it's difficult. So uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, we don't know, right? So we still the, the, going to back the first question just now. In acute emergency situation, as indication, but this is medium airway syndrome. We know all of us here know, I think, if we do really, really bilateral, that's it. This is going to be a death sentence for this patient. But you are as a frontliner, Ujit, can you share your experience? How then you go about this? Because uh, of, uh, yeah, I can imagine, yeah. So, yeah, after all your hard works, right? So, this, this happened. Um, yeah, but uh, I think uh, for us uh, at the at the front lines, um, we are always uh, following our algorithm. So um, I think uh, the early recognition is always a challenge to us in these kind of situations, uh, especially when they come with uh, airway and uh, breathing issues, and you have to uh, intubate these these patients early and uh, start resuscitation. So it's always a, a challenge in recognition, and uh, the resuscitation is always based on the algorithm. So I think a few uh, twerks that we had discussed here, especially in a, a analgesia-based sedation or especially in a, a, 
uh, the other measures that we have discussed, I think it will definitely help in uh, recognition of this condition. But um, uh, rec early recognition remains a challenge in uh, this, this kind of patients to the emergency. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, the, the challenges also sometimes happen for us because of, as you can see, you are intubating the patient, and as you mentioned at the end, it's now we cannot assess, and then uh, preferably uh, analgesia sedation uh, or uh, intubation uh, will be uh, preferred. But again, then we need the expert to really know how how to handle that. Um, I'm also uh, learning slowly because we're doing thrombectomy nowadays, and we ourselves. Uh, call sedate the patient uh, yeah, nowadays. So um, yeah, just a bit of sharing over there. Uh, some of our patients just half uh, call media medulla, and we know this is usually associated uh, uh, with uh, intracranial disease, uh, there's a stenosis, and sometimes they survive uh, in the ward, but ultimately, again, at the moment, I have no long-term survival for such a uh, patient. Um, if you can appreciate the initial part of Dr. Gurjit sharing this now, medulla is a small structure, but it's really, really important. Just a bit of a problem is associated with uh, high mortality. Uh, we still have time, right? So um, we don't have any other question yet over here. Uh, you can unmute or raise your hand. I, I can see everyone, I think, here. And um, uh, Gurjit, uh, there's a call figure just now, you were sharing about cervical spine motivation, elevated ICP. Um, so basically, uh, maybe, um, yeah, interesting, you mentioned about uh, the head posture. Head posture of 30 degrees Celsius, uh, 30 degrees Celsius, not 30 degrees. So basically, uh, what, what do you think uh, at the current moment about this head posture? Uh, is there any well, uh, hard evidence for this? Uh, yeah, I, I uh, trauma. Uh, okay, check uh, is around. <laughs> your, your connection could be wrong. Okay, sorry. Sorry. We so, are uh, sabotaged by I the think, Wi Fi. I think, uh, overall, um, um, uh, this, 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 <laughs> this thing is a, li a little bit, uh, uh, it is uh, commonly practiced, especially in the emergencies and in. Because um, uh, in patients, uh, um, we trauma presenting with trauma. Um, it is very difficult to have GCS or any head injury affect the cervical spine. Before the cervical spine that is causing the, the hemotrinsic is uh, held on very rigidly. Elevation of bed, uh, head bed to uh, urgency is almost become a, a routine, you know, uh, where you will uh, tilt the patient up 30 degrees to drain the CSF and ICP and it's held uh, yeah. very rigid, religiously in trauma. But uh, I think uh, in a, in a non-traumatic patient, uh, then then we have to uh, we have to consider further uh, but uh, in, currently in our practice um, in trauma, until there is further imaging, then uh, this, uh, this uh, thing is uh, really held by religious. Yeah. Thank you, Gurjit. Uh, so the, yeah, in the middle, middle just now, maybe uh, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I understand a bit just now. Uh, and I, I actually learned from here because of um, that's actually, for, for example, uh, I really called, uh, had a specific interest in stroke. And as a head post trial, even though it's a negative trial, uh, I think when you look into, uh, as you mentioned just now, something that increases ICP, head trauma, ICH, uh, and maybe a big stroke, then uh, 30 degree uh, called head hit up so a bit, a bit. So it's actually uh, it's preferred uh, because of when you're going too bit too low, then the ICP will increase, and uh, that then compromised as you should check it now the cerebral perfusion. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the thing. And uh, I saw that uh, in the figure just now, so that's Manitol. Uh, so for, for us, uh, called sometimes uh, Manitol is actually a bridging only. 
uh, for ischemic stroke especially. I'm not too sure in the ICH uh, uh, exactly how that uh, we can help in for the long run, but usually uh, even with uh, chaper edema, I think it's a it's a called bridging therapy. What what do you think, uh, Bridget, for that? Yeah, well, uh, actually, this uh, we, we have to understand that uh, these measures are early measures in the emergency department. That means um, we don't have an ICP reading yet. You know, we don't Correct. have a, a, a EBD yet. So these are early measures that are taken to prevent secondary brain injury without any uh, definitive monitoring monitoring uh, tools available in the emergency. So that's why they they hold on rigidly to the to the pathophysiology of the, the head bed elevation, etc. And then also this, um, we are, what we are talking about is early manitol. So we are going to intubate these patients early uh, when they present in a life support, in neurology life support. So in this kind of case, we, we don't really have an objective uh, measure yet of an ICP measure, etc. So that's where we use these kind of tools when we suspect, example, you have unequal pupils and uh, etc. Then you would uh, consider these uh, agents early. That's why a, a bridging therapy early before we can have any definitive measure. And when, once we have definitive measures, then definitely we can, we can tailor accordingly. But early in the emergency without any objective measuring devices, and that's why these agents are considered, let's say it's written like a consideration, consider correct, to use correct. them. Yeah, so, totally so, agree, yeah. yeah to, to prevent the secondary brain damage and then before we get further definitive objective readings of the ICP, et cetera. Yeah, that would be the approach. We still have time a bit. Uh, maybe uh, anyone want to ask question just now? I saw Nazrul. Nazrul still around? Anyone want to ask question? No question, right? Uh, yeah, maybe I then ask uh, another last two questions over here. So, <laughs> so basically, um, there's um, uh, and within the same figure just now about the CPP. Uh, interestingly, I agree with you. Lots of guidelines say MAP goal uh, is actually about 80 to 110, but nearing to more than 100, usually the the blood pressure is quite high already. Uh, we know that in certain patient uh, and we know by now for example in ICH uh, higher MEP is also associated with uh, extension of the hematoma uh, so what is the, your usual way of monitoring can you share so basically uh, you know the busy emergency department so how, how then you advise this looking at the MEP or most of uh, your in Sayang do you have most of the machine that can monitor there will be MEP so then the Staff can have a look. Yeah. So uh, in these uh, uh, neuro emergency patients who are intubated, uh, definitely there is a close vital sign monitoring. So uh, we know that uh, CPP is MAP minus ICP. And uh, without an intervention, sometimes if the patient uh, goes up to the OT, comes uh, down to the ED, it's very rare. Unless there's no bed in the OT and there is EVD monitor, then definitely we can tailor according to the, the ICP reading. But this is very rare. After OT, they are always in the ward. But uh, we can see the trend sometimes in the overcrowding that is affecting the emergencies. If there is a, a reverse triaging happening in patients coming to the ED with the ICP, definitely we can monitor the ICP there. But this is very rare. So in this formula, C CPP is MAP minus ICP. The only thing we can monitor here is the ICP. So um, the ICP, um, there are two ways. Either the MAP, there are two ways. Either it's uh, invasive and arterial monitoring or it's a non-invasive in which we just use our BP cup. So um, what's happened now in majority of emergencies, we have a critical emergency, a critical care special interest as well. And uh, therefore we have this uh, arterial BP monitoring. So we uh, see the arterial waves and get the MAP reading continuously from there. So that is an invasive method of uh, monitoring, which is very accurate and uh, tells us uh, the MAP consistently uh, consistently. But uh, in other centers that are, are not so developed uh, in this uh, critical care based uh, treatment, so then the monitoring device will be non invasive, which is uh, just a BP cuff and reading every five to uh, five to 10 minutes to tailor the MAP accordingly. 
but the ideal thing in the emergency uh, right now is the invasive arterial BP monitoring that can tell us the MAP continuously in this IC, raised ICP patients. Yeah, that's interesting. So basically, the emergency department is equipped for the IABP, yeah, intra-trial uh, pressure monitoring. Uh, yeah, because of those days, I remember when I was an intern, and we discussed about MAP to maintain, and the nurse will look back at our, our face, what do you mean by this MAP? Right, so, and there's no MAP in the BP machine. So, uh, yeah, I think, yeah. Maybe uh, I put up again to the uh, participants if you have any question. Uh, yeah, I think this is very interesting. We can also expand a lot of topic uh, related, uh, related to uh, Dr. Gurjit presentation just now because of neurology, uh, as I shared just now, is not just one part of neurons alone. There's a they're called uh, lots of things that we can discuss from the central to the peripheral and even the neuromuscular junction. So, uh, yeah, maybe we can have a yeah, specific session just to, to, to ask more questions because I, I really learned this now. I also have a few other things that I want to share if uh, time is not the limit. Yeah? Bridget, any, anything you want to share? Yeah, I'll, I'll, just, yeah, I'll, just, I'll just like to add. So, number, no? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just like to add that uh, airway and breathing is a common topic in the emergency, and we learn it in a basic uh, emergency uh, care as well as uh, advanced critical care, etc. But uh, the goal of our presentation today was to present a tailored based approach on neuro emergencies. So, how would we uh, handle airway and breathing issues in neuro emergency patients? So um, how did we uh, tailor our pre-intubation uh, strategies, indications for intubation itself, ventilation strategies, all tailored to neuroemergency, especially medication-wise and uh, a pre-medication treatment to reduce ICP. So that was the goal of the, the presentation. Was to, if, if ever you get a neuroemergency patient with you and you're going to intubate, then maybe you should tailor this critical care based on the neuroemergency uh, uh, methods. So uh, that was uh, the, the uh, highlight of the presentation, actually. Thank you, Dr. Gurjit. Yeah, excellent. As always, uh -huh. and I'll call. Uh, yeah. Ashraf, can uh, I just add one more? Really, really thankful to you. Uh, I hope uh, the participants actually uh, learn a lot. I again uh, learn a lot today. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, from the uh, Euro Emergency Special Interest Group, we welcome question. Uh, we have our Facebook, you can then subscribe to it. And we will also have the ANLS uh, call, uh, program. Uh, call, watch the, uh, call the uh, room in the Facebook if there is any advertisement on that. I think the next one will be Kalina will be in September. Yeah? Um, I, you mean, oh uh, yeah, September, yeah. but it has not been finalized yet. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. Always penuh. Sudah ada dua orang dah yang dah be, uh, apa tu? Okay. Uh, okay. I just wanted to add on about the Gurjit punya ni kan is actually quite a broad topic. But I think uh, interestingly, there is only one condition where you have neurological emergency so called, but you don't need the neurology so much. In fact, it's being managed totally by the toxinologist. Do you Which know one? that? Can you give it a guess? It is almost similar, like a mastina gravis crisis. Oh, the uh, uh, call this tetanus, you, you mean? Uh, no, not really. So there's another one. one. I think it's a it's a uh, envenomation, yeah, snake envenomation. Oh, yeah, oh, the think, neurogenic uh, one, the neurogenic yes. uh, toxin. Exactly, exactly. Like you have cobras group and a LPD group, uh, and and in that kind of situation. Um, uh, I think uh, macam would, would there be any differences in terms of intubating Guruji? I think macam dia macam follow the principle of uh Messina gravis crisis, right? Except that you do not put the patient on sedation because you want to see improvement. Yeah, yeah. so I think I think that's that. Uh, but if you, you we don't sedate these patients, then uh, again we have uh, issues uh, sometimes. So this way again, I think the analgesia based sedation comes in. So whether we would prefer the only analgesia or analgesia and then you top up a little bit with a, a, just a bit of a sedation. Yeah, I think this analgesia-based sedation would be the best here, I think. Yeah, I also actually prefer the analgesia-based. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I can assess the patient. Yeah. Okay. okay. So right. thank you, Gurjit, again. Thank you, uh, everyone. So we're going to stop the recording for a while. Okay. So